My parents went to a college in Philadelphia, but they are divorced. They got divorced pretty early on. Mm -hmm. That kind of shaped my view on relationships. I'll be honest, like for my younger years, I had this idea that relationships were very, um, what is the right word? transactional mm. and you can see how like the female species is just way more advanced than the male species like it's just Up until and, a of course point. We, come on now like ish like yeah when you guys like after 27 then maybe you guys start to sort of <laughs> Right, welcome back to Side by Side Podcast. I'm your host, Brandon. And I'm Damari. We are here to engage in meaningful conversations in hopes to create unity through diversity by enlightening and inspiring minds one question at a time. We do that by bringing on two strangers each week to show we have a lot more in common than meets the eye. Today we have two awesome guests with us today, Siamara Hechevaria and Michelle Brugal. Say hello, ladies. Hello. Hey. <laughs> right. Spicy. Can you um, can you feel the spice? Is yes, it yes. just me? Okay, it's spicy. The uh, Siamara, luckily I have known you for a little while now and knew how to pronounce your name. Otherwise it would have been right. a little Wait, do you actually say the me. H or is it like etch? You say yep, the, H? the H is silent, so okay. Echavarria, you have to Because he said he said H. and I remember yeah, from just, Spanish. Yeah, oh yeah. That yeah, I messed it up already. See, I messed it up already. God, <laughs> that's because that's <laughs> because this is one of these unique episodes where we're not in the studio together. There's something strange going. On. Yeah, yeah, we're doing our first remote uh, episode here. It's been quite stormy in Austin today, so mm -hmm. we had to we had to remote in today. So Damari and I are not normally um, doing it remote. We're usually together. So. Yeah. Here we are. But thank you for being with us. We uh, like to kick it off with a little segment we call Word Association. Um, so each one of us is going to ask you or basically say five words to each of you and one at a time. And when we do it, uh, you're just going to say the first thing that comes to your mind. Sound good? Sounds good. All right. So I think okay. the plan is I'm going to ask Michelle and then uh, Damari is going to ask Siamara. So uh, I'll go first here, and I'll, I'll I'll go with Michelle here. So Michelle, first word, reality TV. Uh... Oh, she's cheating. She's thinking. <laughs> she's like, no, I have reality TV. I watch this, and I. But, uh, no, <laughs> that nah, nah, nah. Okay, that caught me off guard. That caught me off guard. Uh, reality TV, I'm gonna say, like, brain dead. Ooh. Yes, yes, there we go. Yes. All right, next word Broadway. Ooh. Star. Mm. Okay, wow. wellness. Ooh. Lifestyle. Ooh, all right. Motherhood. Hard. <laughs> <laughs> and Serena Williams. Icon. All right. Yeah. Wow. Those are okay. You So you were you were struggling with the first one, but then you just <laughs> hammered them right away there. Yeah, yeah it, it, it just took me by surprise, and I was like, whoa, hold on, <laughs> oh, all right, right, cool. All right, so we got to get into yeah. it. Get reality it. TV. Yeah. You said, hard, but you know I got to know about this reality TV brain dead situation. Can you just dig a little yeah. deeper for us, please? I just feel like, not, like no shade towards reality TV. Like, I like to watch it when I just like want to like zone out, and like literally I'm like exhausted, and I just don't want to think, yeah. and I'm brain dead, and I'm just like – all right, this is just happening in front of me. I mean, I feel like maybe earlier in my youth, I would like get into it and the drama and the thing and like the Kardashians, but it's just, it's just a little silly to me. And, um, 
you know, I, I think it's, it's a good pastime when you just literally. So what, 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 what was um, like I think, the, the catalyst or the impetus to make you change, you know, from, I guess that brain dead thing to being like I a time for this. <laughs> well, yeah, I just think it's just like the phase in your life when you, um, uh, indulge in these sort of, um, frivolous and fun and like, um, shallow, <laughs> um, uh, forms of entertainment, right? Like going out, partying all night, going to the club, like, you know, you have the energy and the time to invest in this. I think once you, um, you're in a different phase of your life where maybe you are more focused on your career or you have a family or like your time is more limited, then you become a little bit more particular about like what you invest your time in. And for me, um, I watched hours of Bravo and E and like HGTV and kept up with the Kardashians. And I did that. And like, that doesn't entice me anymore because first of all, I know that it's not realistic, right? Even reality TV is scripted or is, um, you know, formulated to, to follow a certain storyline and to sell a certain image or sell images or ideas yeah. to you. It's nothing. It's just like, Oh, this is reality. That's not right. true. I've been behind the camera. Like I know what's up. So, um, you know, like I said, it's, it's fun. And you know, sometimes you're just like, Oh, I just don't, you know, I just want to be entertained. Yeah. Right. So it's cool to do it for that. But for me, like if I'm going to really invest my time in my brain cells, which are <laughs> so limited at this point in my life, you know, I, there's, they're for something else. So, uh, like I said, again, like no shade, like, you know, if you want to be on an Island naked on a first date, cool, but that's not really how I'm going to spend my time. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I'm around it a little bit cause it's my wife's the same way. She's like, likes to throw something on the background and like it's on. And so sometimes even though I like can't stand reality TV, sometimes I catch myself going like, what happened? What'd she say? Yeah. <laughs> and so like, yeah, you just kind of like by osmosis, right. if you're around it, you get like infected by it. You know? And then the, I the housewives, right? That's her thing. Yeah, she, the Housewives and the Bachelorette. And the Bachelorette, so, right? Those are the two. Yeah, people love the Bachelorette. I've never even seen it, yeah. so that I've tells never seen you. It either, I'm like, you know, I have. I've never seen it either. To the Bachelorette. <laughs> yeah, no. For me, the only reality show I will say, and and I gotta say, so there is a reality show uh, for the UFC called The Ultimate Fighter, and it is somewhat real. It's okay. scripted to do a certain somewhat extent real. for like the background right. stuff. But the fights are real, so I'm only yeah. really watching oh, I'm sure. for the That's... fighters and to see who makes it, you know. Well, actually, actually, like there are some that like, like Georgia, my husband, and I will watch like, like surviving in, yes. in wild oh, or whatever. Yeah. We like those kinds of things, like that are like reality, but it's like you know, task oriented or like survival yeah. or like mm. some sort of you know that sort of thing. That's interesting know because a, you also learn so there's much. There's one called Alone on Netflix that's pretty big. That's like that. It's the survival, right? That's I think that's the one we watched, and we were like, you know, oh my god, how are these people going to do it? <laughs> so you know, there are there are shows that are like reality. TV, you can consider that they're under that category, but you know they're not just like the housewives. Yeah, yeah totally. Uh, Damari, you're up. I'm up. Siomara. Right. <laughs> Lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Romance. Love. New York City. Oh, New York City, I would say hustle. Matthew McConaughey. Hot. <laughs> yes. Correct <Really>. answer. <laughs> <laughs> Relationships. Monogamy. Interesting. Very interesting. Let's dig a little bit deeper on monogamy. Let's dig a little bit deeper on monogamy. Yes, Relationships. I'm happy to. You you hear that? You hear monogamy. Why is that? I do. I think growing up, especially like 
I guess in my generation, we hear a lot of songs like monogamy is not for everyone. And I think a lot of my generation were a lot more open to accepting things. But as I've gotten older, I've encountered more people that are into less monogamous relationships and more polyamorous relationships and experiencing everyone and having their cake and eating it too. And it's not coming from a judgment place at all, but I am saying that when I think of relationships, I think of a relationship with one other person and growing with that person and Mm. growing together and creating a family versus having to have that experience with multiple people. And so for me, I want to experience everyone as our relationship than having multiple relationships with other people, if that makes sense. Mm. Mm. Totally makes sense. So correct me if I'm wrong. What I'm hearing you say is people who are in polyamorous relationships probably watch reality TV shows. (laughs) (laughs) You know, there's a good chance. There's There's probably a correlation. We should run some stats later and see if there's a correlation. So, uh, Okay, you 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 seem like you're you're coming from experience or something. Like, have you have you like been involved in a polyamorous relationship that didn't work out or like expand if you can? No, no, no. But actually, one of my close friends has been really interested in it, and it just for me, it just doesn't make sense in my head. But that's not saying that I'm not happy for that person to do that and experience that. And I think that at the end of it, it really comes down to you have to really break down why you're interested in something like that. And maybe that's just because you think that it's great. But a lot of it comes back to like how your childhood was raised and similar to how you guys were mentioning we should break into, you know, how we were upraised, like grown up and things like that. I think our upbringing is really important because maybe our parents didn't work out and maybe we just saw a lot of single home problems that we think that we can find happiness with multiple people or something like that. But for me, I just, I don't think that relationship makes sense. Oh, I I don't know. I'm, I feel bad because I'm on live and I, I don't want to sound like I'm coming from a judgment. No, no, you're fine. Uh, It looked like Michelle has something to say because I was going to ask you a question. Yeah. Yeah. Are you, are you in a relationship if I may ask? No, I'm not. No. Okay. Does the idea or does the, um, saying out loud, like being with one person for the rest of your life, does that scare you? No. Or does that make you feel like excited? That makes me so happy. It makes me so happy. I think that really, Oh, absolutely. And on that, that's coming from a place of knowing that, knowing myself is a journey, right? So that other person's also going on a journey. So our relationship is another journey of figuring each other self, each other out. So like, it's going to be a lifelong journey. And I don't want to do that with multiple people. There's no way I'm going to meet you in the depths that I want to meet you with the time that we have here on earth. There's no way. So is monogamy selfish? Oh, uh selfish um no no, i think it's the opposite i think you're sacrificing um the reality that there may be times that maybe that's not what you desire but it's a commitment that you make to your partner Mm -hmm. that if that's what you chose if that's what you both agree that that's the kind of relationship you want to have um that you're going to stick to that Mm. where like, you know, I'm married and I love my husband and I do want to be with him for the rest of my life. And I do want to grow into this like beautiful journey. Like you just explained it so beautifully, but honestly, like the idea that this is it, this is the only person that I'm going to have, you know, whatever kind of intimacy, not just sexual, but you know, for the rest of my life, for me, I'm like, Okay, hold up. <laughs> That's scary. That is that challenges who I am at the core, um, how I like to connect with people, and you know, in those hard times. Like, I mean, we have a really, I'm very lucky to say, healthy, beautiful relationship. But like, it always gets tough with your partner, 
And in those moments, you know, like you have to go back to that commitment in your head where like, okay, no, like this is it. This is the person that you chose to be in this monogamous yeah. relationship but you touched with. So <laughs> for me, that's yeah, alarming. I highly agree, but this is not about <laughs> me. So like, uh, you touched on something, right? Which is, it's more so like you're holding on to an ideal, right? And you're more committed to the ideal than you are to the person, which is no matter what, I'm going to be committed to you and I'm not going to step out on that. And we grow. Ideally, we're, we're all growing. Change is inevitable. But we're not all growing at the same rate. So you may outgrow someone, someone may outgrow you. And anytime that there's an imbalance in these frequencies, there's going to be turmoil, right? Because you guys just aren't seeing it on the same wavelength. So, you know, how do you commit to that ideal? And I want to start with Z uh, CMR here. How do you commit to that ideal to commit to monogamy? So, as you know, I'm speaking from not being in a relationship, but... You, I mean, you've I been in a relationship. Right, you're beautiful. Yes, obviously, I've been in a relationship, and I just, okay. yeah, I've never considered it. But I think I would commit to it in knowing. I think that's one of the unspoken rules and things that you know going into a marriage, at least, is we're going to evolve into different people as we grow together, and so it's like the constant learning of each other that you have to accept as well. And trust me, like I'm coming from a home of two divorced parents, you know what I mean? So I understand that people can outgrow each other very quickly and that can happen. But I think there's also, you know, if you weren't really meant for each other, like you, you know, you know, there's like yeah. kind of that voice in your head of like pushing it aside. Like maybe we can figure it out. Maybe we've heard it out. But you, you've heard it before. You've told yourself already, this probably won't work out, but for the sake of whatever, I'm going to keep making it work. And I think it's that trust that you have within yourself of knowing that you're going to make the best decision. So if I truly find a person and I'm like, I am willing to learn this person every single day for the rest of my life. Cool. Like I will be very much monogamous, but I also don't know what the benefits of being polyamorous are. Like what are the benefits of knowing multiple people and like getting to constantly know multiple, it's exhausting. Like you're also learning yourself at the same time. So it's just, what are the benefits of it? And if there is something that I'm missing, I'm happy to explore that as well. But um, I think the commitment is just knowing. That I mean, I don't know. It. Like, I think that's a really interest. I think that's a really interesting question. Cause if you look at communities, like, um, which are, which is the, is it, which is the religion that's polyamorous? Um, um, yeah. The Mormons. Mormons. Uh, I mean, well, really, yeah. it's, it's, is it Mormons? it's not quite, polyamorous by definition it's it's more like misogynistic because the guys have multiple wives so they don't call that a yeah i guess like the whole yeah. sister wife scene. but but there are I I, i'm just they using that as an example polygamy, where there are polyamorous is everyone that's true everything. polygamy right right but i mean in in a way yeah yeah, yeah. you know Poly it's kind of both it's yeah. in a sense um, and who knows, really? Um, <laughs> but uh, spicy. <laughs> um, but I'm just using that as an example, like where maybe there's a certain structure where, um, you know, you get certain things from different people. Certain, you know, there you get certain things from certain people, right? So, like, you're fulfilled in a way by this person or the other, or if it's like really polyamorous you there's some sort of balance that you find within within that and so um you know it's interesting to me like even with um lots of friends who uh are either you know gay or or bi or lgbtq whatever and they have open relationships in that same sense i'm like okay well then how does this work for you like mm -hmm. i want to know too like what was good. Like, <laughs> let me be clear. It's not just about you being able to sleep with whoever you want. Like if you're really, if you have a relationship with a person and you open it up to other people, like what are the benefits of it? Like how do you flourish and grow within your own relationship or how does that work? And, um, like learning people's different experiences has, it doesn't change like what I personally want, but like it, it definitely, 
um, deepens my understanding of like my own, um, uh, versatile, um, barometer of needs or like desires, right? right? Like, even though I am fully committed to my husband and I want to grow with him and be with him, like, I know that there may be times where I might desire or want something else, but, and not, I I wouldn't say that it's like the, I'm married to the ideal of being monogamous because I also think that's just like socially constructed and like, I I don't care about that any, like, you know, in, in a way, but I do think that, like you said, when you find that person that you do know is right for you and, um, you know, is like, Oh, this is it. This is my person. This is the one it's like committing to their growth and your growth. Like you said, like knowing that you're going to evolve, evolve into different people or not necessarily different, but just evolve and like communicating, being able to communicate with each other about about those things right. and um and then like seeing where you land yeah and i, I and think I, go back on uh, something that damari was saying about people outgrow each other at different rates or they grow at different rates um and in where they're at in their lives and that kind of uh hit something for me because you know speaking from my experience of of being in a long-term monogamous relationship and finding somebody who um is very important to me uh, I think part of it is when the when the ideal or the value kind of side of it lines up with the person, it it also it makes for a good recipe. And furthermore, right. I think to touch on what Damari was, I think trying to ask UCMR and, and get at to answer what he was talking about is, I think if when you're with someone and the, yeah, you might grow at different rates or you might grow at different speeds, but part of the greatness of a truly good and healthy monogamous relationship is finding someone who will, will help you balance and will help you grow and wait for you Mm. to catch up to them and you wait to catch up to them. And that's part of the growth and the, the, the the beautiful part of the relationship. And so I think, um, you know, I've certainly experienced that there've been times where I am not growing as fast as my wife is in a certain area and she's Mm -hmm. been patient and waited for me and likewise, the same for, for me to her. So I think that if you have that sort of, um, you know, balance and that back and forth, it helps strengthen. No, I, I think you just hit it on the head. For me, I see it the exact right. opposite. It's just like, oh, my gosh, I have to slow down for this person. Oh, oh, you have more uh, learning to do. That's how I feel. <laughs> I want to go and I want you to be in go mode like at all times and you're not on in, in, in go mode. And you know me, Rizzo, personally, and like I'm on go, bro. Like that's just that's just where I am. So the the thing is, like, someone had said this to me, like, some years ago, and it just always stuck with me. It's like, all right, I'll, 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 I'll start with you, Michelle. Michelle, what, what's your favorite song, like, when you were in high school that you can remember? What was my favorite song when I was That in you high would school? just jam to, like, oh, any <laughs> one of them. Um... I mean, really, anything by TLC, hey. probably. Anything on the Crazy Sexy Cool album. <laughs> okay, TLC, one of the tracks from there. CMR, favorite song in high school? Um, first? She was like last year. <laughs> no, for real. First thing? She's like, I'm just gorgeous, young girl. <laughs> okay, so first thing coming to mind, which honestly brings this whole conversation in full circle, is Wale has a song with Tier and it's called Bad. And literally, he starts a song with monogamy or whatever you call it. I'm starting to think isn't for everybody. Most of us are rushing into it anyways. You're either like rushing to love or whatever. But anyway, so the lyrics, the chorus was... I've never been in love. You got to listen to the song if you haven't already, because it's a little provocative, but um, I literally nothing. I never had trust issues or anything, but I was listening to the song and attached my personality to it. It was like, yeah. So you like that song. We personally like to hate on Wale on this show, but that's a whole nother (laughs) conversation. Uh, what? If you go oh, watch some of our older episodes, you'll see an episode where we really spend about 20 minutes hating on Wale. But 
Oh, we have to unpack that for sure. I mean, I can't let you guys know. Here, we're getting, we're getting <laughs> I mean, cute. I, I really personally was I mean, not hate. Listen, I don't hate on Wale, but I don't love on Wale because I just. Okay. Sounds like you hate I, on Wale. I mean, listen, I just don't think. Listen, he has lyrics. He's a lyrical guy. Mm -hmm. He's got bars. Mm -hmm. It's just the same mm -hmm. cadence every time, and it just bothers me. So. That's okay. Oh, so are we just going to then dive into... This is not, we dive into not about trap. People. This is about okay? <laughs> are we going to talk about music then? And, 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 we could do that. Mari, you you were making you were making a point, though. You said, so what was the favorite song in right, high school? Right, exactly. Thank you. Oh, yes. Yeah. So, favorite song in high school. <laughs> Someone analogize this to me. So, Max, that song bad. You didn't give me a specific song. Give me a specific Let's just let's just go with like scrubs. No scrubs. Let's just you know, on, didn't we all just heard it over the weekend at a wedding? It's hard. I prefer I I I I, I prefer uh, pigeons. No pigeons, but we'll go with no scrubs. <laughs> so imagine every time you wanted to listen to music, that was the only song you could listen to. Every time, that's monogamy for the rest of your mm. life. No, no, because you could choose the song. You want to of course, to the and they of just life. chose the song. No, but you gave them a strict set of parameters okay, cool. that they were setup. forced to choose it. Cool. I went from high school because that was what you liked. Because okay. if I had to listen to Purple Rain for the rest of my life, I would be happy with that. Cool. You know what? That was a contender. I'm not going to lie. Is it? Purple Rain's a contender. Well, I think you're trying to hate on monogamy. Prince. I'm not here I'm for it. I'm not going to hate on monogamy, bro. I just want to get to the bottom of it because what Michelle said is it's a social construct. And in other societies, polygamy is a social construct. So it's not something of our own creation, of our own volition. It was imposed on us. Well, I, well, get to me like, I don't know if I agree with that. Yeah. Like the parameters of what monogamy means and is yes you can say that but like human behavior and coupling mm -hmm. i think is a very natural thing mm -hmm. and you know of course before it was procreation and let's populate the earth so yes like we they were you were spreading your seed and so you know that's a different story monogamy didn't really fit the bill then but i think coupling and finding partnership is a very i agree but um, would that behavior. man still find another couple with another person because when i'm looking at uh african culture going far back uh which is the original man and looking at asiatic the asiatic black man uh that's kind of what it boils down to. So, well, then, uh, like I said, like that was about more about like populating the earth, and and obviously society was different back then. So I, you know, I agree and disagree. I I think that that uh, yes, in a way, monogamy is a social construct, but also. I do think that we seek partnership and that we do like stability. And I think, you know, if you're, like I said, like uh, taking the open relationship example, like if you're having sexual adventures by yourself or with your partner is one thing, but like to settle into a relationship to have like a partnership, um, I think that naturally we do gravitate towards that for stability and growth. In our so let me ask you this, think, what so, is stability? Stability is um, knowing what to expect. Stability is, you know, the, the same, same monotonous so that you're routine, comfortable. which yeah. mono is the root word of monogamy. So it's that right. same routine. Mm -hmm. I certainly agree. I think it's strange. I My life is, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. No mm. idea. Well, I mean, you... Also, but you've been in a monogamous or long term relationship before. So, look at you exposing mm -hmm. my life to these. Oh, because then let's go. <laughs> I don't know what the hell talk about me, 
<laughs> or have you been? I know. Have you been? Yeah. Well, <laughs> to ask you. Have you been? <laughs> have you been? Like, do you speak from experience that that you agree or disagree with, or is this like an idea I, I mean, no, I that you? I just believe that when I was a child, I was really, really, really into uh, fish sticks. And um, okay. I don't like fish sticks so more. I like tuna tartare. So, so if I had to continue to eat fish sticks for the rest of my life, I don't think I'd be happy. Yeah, but those fish yeah. sticks could have evolved. I think a lot of people <laughs> I never get hung up. Into a tuna tartar. I think part of the issue too is you're getting a little hung up on is, and I think people conflate sexual relationship with a relationship. Come on, Pastor. They're not exactly. the same thing. Come on. A relationship that we're talking about that certainly I know Michelle's talking about and I, I'm talking about and I think CMR is as well is not one that's purely oh, sexual. Did you just call her DMR? Like, did you just combine her names? No, I said CMR. No, no CMR. I just said DMR. <laughs> um, so, so it's polygamy, the, 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 the polygamous part of it, really what it is, what it boils down to is, is a sexual thing. Because mm -hmm. in those polygamous tribes, those societies in the past, they, it really was about reproduction and for sex. It wasn't necessarily about – and they've actually done a lot of research on this I think in the, in the, in the past couple of decades of current polygamous societies that um, actually when you build those societies or the societies kind of emerge, there's a, a higher rates of violence because when the pool of mates – uh, dwindles for men, like men, it, the competition for the, for the men vying for the, the females, uh, obviously there's going to be less men with more women. And so that tends towards more violence because of the competition and then the frustration and all the things. But violence know, where about. though? Amongst the haters who can't get any girls because they're not in the top five? No, within the society, <laughs> within the society in general. So then you have, you The know, top 5% is going to win every problems. time, bro. Anyways, back to what I was trying to say, though. So <laughs> conflating the two, I think, is something that a lot of people fall in the trap of because when they, they think about going on dates and, and meeting people, they're, they're thinking about purely in the beginning, at least, you want to be attracted to someone. You want to find that person mm -hmm. that, that gets you going mm -hmm. and all that good stuff to, to generate the passion of the relationship. But that's – I mean that's – if you're just looking for sex, like then, yeah, of course you're not going to – you're not going to find it in a monogamous relationship. Then monogamous oh, yeah. sucks. No, I, agree. I think he's spot on. And I feel like a lot of people, honestly, I've talked to like polyamorous people and they say the same thing that Rizzo just said, which is when people think poly for some reason, they instantly think sex. But when you think monogamy, you don't really think that. You think of like the relationship and all of these other extra attributes that add to the relationship. But with poly, the right. moment with someone I spoke with, they said, they just start talking about sex because that's just how they're right. thinking. I want to shift. You have exactly. something, CMR? No, no, no. I disagree with both uh, of you. Okay. Yeah. Disagree or agree? <laughs> I do. Agree 100%. I think oh, oh, and agree. I'll just have yeah. one little take. But um, I agree just coming from like a spiritual level of knowing me and myself and my body. Um, I'm not really looking to share it with multiple people at the same time that's exhausting it's draining it's almost like your phone battery like you have to recharge yourself how could i give it to multiple people all the time and if that's what you're looking for and that serves you in your season that's great but i think when i think of monogamy it's like i am trying to be a full cup for my other partner and i'm sure they're doing the same but i'm trying to pour into them as well and like if we want to just keep showing up as our like best selves every single day we need we need we need ourselves to show up as our best selves. And like, obviously that's not going to happen every day, but have it. I, I can barely text my mom back sometimes. Like imagine texting three other people. Come on. I couldn't do it. Please, I'm sorry. Please text like, your mom back. <laughs> please text your mom back. You only get one. So appreciate it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I want to shift gears a little bit and just dig a little bit deeper. So we're talking to you, Amara. Just walk us through your upbringing, you know, family structure, and how you got to where you are professionally. I'm happy to. So 
I was born in New Jersey. I lived in Delaware for about seven years, and then I moved to Twinsburg, Ohio for hey. um, eight years. Yes, Brandon, we, we went to the same high school. Grew up Wait, in y'all went to in Twinsburg? Yeah, it's a yes. crazy Wait, story. I'm going to let her... Sorry. I want to let her finish, but I'll, I'll tell the story of how we... Beyonce had yeah, the best I'll... video of all time. <laughs> he does this every time I say that. It's so annoying. <laughs> no, no, and I then... definitely want to tell that story. But go... oh. Got to. So then after graduating high school, I went to UNLV in Las Vegas for hospitality and marketing. And I was in Las Vegas for about seven years. I moved to Austin. Two... It'll be two years in October. And I am currently in events. My experience is in marketing, production, film. The whole integrated marketing umbrella is where I'm at right now. I have a YouTube channel. I wrote a book. And just, you know, constantly evolving, essentially. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. You right. wrote a book. I did. I did. It'll be two years next week will be the two-year mark. Plug the book. Plug the um, book. Oh, of course. She is available on Amazon and Kindle. It is titled A God's Dream. I saw it. And it is 25 blessings that I learned in 25 years. To me, the lessons that I learned, whether it be through all the trauma or whatever, to me were blessings. So I decided to write a book about it. So we touch on duality. We touch on generational curses. We touch on, you know, birds of a flock that fly together so like my friends from middle school high school that i'm still so close to we touch on everything anxiety all of those things that have to me are blessings that you can learn through so mm. yeah love that that's awesome yeah so cool thank um, you guys real quick before we toss it over to michelle just to tell a story it was kind of funny um situation so <laughs> Uh, I grew up in Twinsburg, Ohio, and then uh, moved to Chicago, moved to LA, moved to Austin, and landed in Austin. From uh, my my wife's job brought us here, and I'm in my job, and I've been working here for a couple of years. And then we hire Ciamara to the job uh, to work at the company, and um, we somehow put two and two together. We we're from both. I think we we're Cleveland. from around Cleveland. We both have and a two we, and six number. Yeah, it was the, it was two one six number, and then I was like, "Well, where did you grow up in Cleveland?" She's like, "Twinsburg." I was like, "No way, get out of here!" And it was just so weird because we never met growing up. So wait, you didn't know each yeah, other in high school? So, uh, CMR is a bit younger than me. So what is even crazier is one of her good friends from high school. I was his camp counselor when I when I was like when I was like a <laughs> senior or junior in high school. I was camp counselor for for her uh, her grade or like their group. And, uh, and so, and, and he moved to LA at one point when I was working in LA and I, I, I hooked him up with a job at the place I was working at at the time. And so it was just these weird coincidences and we ended up at the same company in Austin together and uh, we had no idea that we grew up in the same town. So you were the only Cuban in Twinsburg, no, Ohio. Well, I have a brother. Yeah. There was actually, no. a few. yeah. Well, y'all. Yeah. It's a pretty, really? it's a very diverse community. Very like, diverse. Where we grew up. I mean, uh, and it's by, it's close to Cleveland yeah, it's about, or is a suburb of Cleveland? Yeah, about 30 minutes south of Cleveland. Oh, okay. So all That's the why. suburbs outside of Cleveland, um, for the most part, there are, there are lots of them that are pretty, you know, white or, you know, ten, are black or whatever. But I would say the majority of the ones near where we were from, we're very integrated. And I don't know if it has something to do with the history of Cleveland, very just much. like people moving around or whatever. But it's a it's a very um, very diverse community, like the mega the, the metropolis of Cleveland, and it's a very high uh, Jewish population because a lot of uh, I think Jewish people settled there after World War II. Uh, lots of black people from the Great Migration. You have tons of white people there, blue collar. So it's just a very diverse uh, area, and people always think. Ohio corn fed, like, you know, right. corn fields, but no, there's so, you know, some diversity in Ohio. Oh, I've spent my fair share of time in Ohio. I've been a little bit up and down, but, um, yeah, that's, it's always so interesting to me to hear, you know, like, uh, how Caribbean people, um, end up in like the Midwest. Oh, I'm like, wait, I need to know because, you know, it's like, we always go the East mostly East coast. Mm -hmm. You know, mostly East Coast. Yeah. Um, there's not even many in California and LA. Like everyone's from Mexico. There were 
maybe some like Portuguese or Brazilian, a little bit of that community, but very little Caribbean mm. Latinos, you know oh, what I'm saying? Absolutely. Like mostly yeah. Central America. So whenever I meet anyone that's from the West Coast or in, you know, the Midwest that's like Dominican or Puerto Rican or Cuban or whatever, I'm like, okay, I need to know this story because it's just interesting to me how how people get to to you know to move so, around so, exactly. So so Ciamara, you know, you you kinda you brought us up to date, but you brought us up to date in a very like Hillary Clinton esque way. And we want to <laughs> dig a little bit oh, deep. No. Right? No, no Wait, that's what doing. So how you know, <laughs> Okay, so you 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 bounced around. What, what were you doing in Vegas? What was your family structure like? What was your parents' life like? How did you get all the way to what you're oh, doing yes. professionally? We we need oh, we need an insight. Guys. Okay, I didn't know we had time, but we had time. So oh, we got um, time. Oh yeah. Similar to what Michelle was mentioning, my parents are from the East Coast, but my dad was in pharmaceutical sales, so he was in charge of regions. So there, his region moved us to the Midwest, and he's now in the west coast he's in las vegas um my parents went to a college in philadelphia but they are divorced they got divorced pretty early on Mm -hmm. um and so that kind of shaped my view on relationships i'll be honest like for my younger years i had this idea that relationships were very um what is the right word transactional Mm. and I had to kind of shift that mindset as I've been growing into myself. I'm going to be 27 next week. And so I think a lot of it just comes with trying to heal my childhood self that saw my parents kind of breaking apart. Um, Mm. So then moving to Las Vegas, I went to college there, you know, I was in a sorority, went to school, Where'd you go? but growing up in Las Vegas, university of Nevada, Las Vegas, UNLV. Gang, gang. Yes, gang in here. So, I mean, it was great. But, like, you're going to college in Las Vegas, right? So, you grow up really quickly. I moved there when I was 17. I was in the clubs by 17 and a half. And, like, by your 21st birthday, you're like, oh, it's my grandma year. Like, you don't want to go out, you know? So, Because Vegas is, like, the best place to be young and hot. Like, everything's hot. Oh, everything's free. And you check those boxes. I can go back tomorrow. Yeah. I could go back tomorrow and have dinner, everything free. Like it's incredible. I do recommend Vegas. Vegas dinner? is you for the girls. In, uh, you ever go to Vegas? You hang out, oh, a or you hang out on the strip. Lavo. Um, I like to stay in the Summerlin Vegas. area, but if oh you go out, the Cosmo is my favorite hotel. The Cosmo and the Wynn are my two favorites. Oh my god, this is so funny. <laughs> What's funny? Why, yeah. Dallas? Are you because, going? No, because I lived in what? Vegas for a year. We and make this stuff yeah. Up. And I hated it. Did you? I mean, I didn't love it. Yes. That's why I moved. But why did you hate it? No, but you grew up, you kind of grew up there and you went there for college. But um, that's where I met my husband, actually, originally. Yo. We met in Vegas. And I worked at the Cosmopolitan. I worked at the Cosmopolitan. I was in a show at the Cosmopolitan at Rose Rabbit Live, (laughs) if you know what that is or was. Oh, my gosh. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. And uh, and I lived in Henderson. You lived it. Okay, what was Henderson? I know I was right there. Henderson, this is which crazy. I liked. I liked Henderson too. But anyway, that's I'm sorry, crazy. Can I take yeah. a second to geek out with Rizzo for a second, yeah. bro. Remember yeah. when we came up with the concept for this show, and we have no yeah. idea what people are into and who they are. This is like yeah. literally it, bro. Yeah. yeah, you guys said people that have opposing, and me and Michelle are just we're getting like this. Okay, <laughs> no, <that's, that's laughs> I'm like, I did love living in. I hate. I kind of hated Vegas, but like I was there not long enough to really create community. Mm. To be fair, yeah. um, and but I did love living in Henderson, and it was the first time in like my adult life that I could like afford to live on my own and have like a normal life and like afford to go to the farmer's market and then PG and, comes in you know, and interrupts it all <laughs> <laughs> well we'll get to that later but anyway it's just i'm like oh my god you lived in vegas i lived in vegas this is so funny amazing <laughs> and it is a town for girls you could Dude, basically I, I, just I live your best life and not pay for anything thing. i'm coming back a hot girl <laughs> there's no way around everything's free <laughs> well, that's interesting because i think you I could would, do it now though i, think I would come back with a guy conversation with my nephew i was like hey man if, if things get really rough bro i'm coming back really bad 
like, because I got a nice little <laughs> cheekbones. I'm coming back. You're kind of pretty. Yeah. You're kind of pretty. That was my hood name in Chicago. They called me Pretty Boy. I'm coming back to Mariana. <laughs> I don't so know. tell us more. We'll, we'll, we'll circle back. She said we'll table that one. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll work table on the that name. one. I like Demariana. <laughs> why not? <laughs> so what happened um, in Vegas? Well, let's so let's get Vegas, Michelle. You, well, so you, were you there for high school or just for college, and you decided to stay? Just college. Stayed for about two years after, and then. I moved to Austin, October 2020, mid-COVID, and That's I was lucky I to not get Which, laid off. What was yeah, the date? Was, um, October, maybe 12th, 2020, okay, around okay, the mid-October. Well, That's crazy. Yeah, you guys and, moved in the same month. I never put two and two together. Yeah. Come on. A lot of, so, lot of uh, yeah. synchronicities here on this episode. <laughs> this really yeah. And so, I mean, I was lucky enough to not have gotten laid off. I was working at an advertising agency in Las Vegas. And I didn't get laid off during COVID, so I was wearing a lot of hats at the agency. But I knew that I wanted to move to Austin when my lease was up. It was October, so I was just working. I actually um, I moved to Austin, I think, October 11th. I got my keys to my apartment, and my car got delivered that same day. And I started at WeWork October 12th. So it mm. all just like flowed so perfectly. And here I am in Austin. So. Love that brings that. you guys up to speed. I, yeah. I love it. And we definitely want to dig into your awesome experience, but we definitely want to give Michelle an opportunity. So, Michelle. Of course. Set us up, man. What was your upbringing like? Uh, single parent household? Not, I mean, siblings, all the way to your professional career, what you're doing today. Oh, wow. And you have time. Uh, Don't feel so... rushed. So. <sighs> Let's see. Um, I was actually born in New York. So my family's from Dominican Republic. And my mom kind of grew up back and forth a little bit between Dominican Republic and New York. So they, she did live and grow up here and go to school here throughout um, her life. I don't know. It's, it's not unclear, but it was kind of like my grandfather used to work at the piers and then he, I don't know if he had an accident and then he was like, um, you know, then he retired, but then they moved back and, you know, they kind of went back and forth. So anyway, they sort of had a little bit of a life here before I was even born. Um, I have an older sister with, um, say mother and father. And, um, she was also born here in New York after I was born. She's almost five years older than me. We moved back to Dominican Republic. So I was born here, but left mm. right away. Um, and I grew up in Dominican Republic. Well, I lived in Dominican Republic until I was about oh, six-ish. Um, in the capital, in Santo Domingo. I love it there. Uh, oh. That's where my father lived. That's where my mother lived. Wow. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's cool. Uh, so I lived there till I was about like around six, and my mother remarried. Um, my parents also divorced when I was born, basically. So, or right around the time after I was born. So we moved back to Dominican Republic and then they separated, but I grew up, uh, even though they were separate, like still very close. We're all very close. So I grew up, you know, going to my dad's family's house and with my mom and my mom's family, we were all, you know, it was sort of like a blended family. Um, then my mom remarried when I was around six and, um, we moved back to New York and she was pregnant with my little sister. Um, and, uh, we didn't last here very long. She was like, nah, I can't live this life anymore. Like I'm used to the Caribbean. So we moved to Miami after my sister was born here, my little sister, we moved to Miami and that's where I spent my formative years. I spent, um, from seven to 17 mm. in Miami. So elementary school, middle school, high school. Um, and I have a younger sister who was also born here, but then after she was born right away and I have my a younger boy, brother Ian. who was born in Miami. No, Ian is Ian. My boy, my your boy, Ian, my brother is my youngest brother from my father's second marriage. Mm -hmm. So my mom remarried and had two kids with 
uh, my stepfather who basically raised me because we all lived in the same household. And then my father remarried and had my younger brother, my youngest brother, Ian, and he was born and grew up in Jersey. So my father remarried and they were married to the Dominican Republic. But then after she became pregnant, she moved here to Jersey because she had family here to have them here in the States. And then they also basically separated. Um, so my father remained in Dominican Republic and my brother grew up in Jersey. So I have a very blended family, <laughs> lots of uh, siblings and like, you know, grandmothers grandfathers extended family members but we're all like it's a super blended family like we all know each other we all love each other we all spend time together like it's that's the cool part about having this big family that like you know um so my experience with like divorce and relationship and separation i mean was i guess also traumatic in a way you know as all of our lives can be but because we were all um almost like one big happy family or take happy away one big family. Um, I didn't, um, I didn't have any sort of preconceived or consciously preconceived notions about relationships. Like I didn't formulate like, Oh, this is what happened to me. So this is now what I'm seeking. Or at least I didn't realize that I had, you know, anything like that for me, it was all normal mm -hmm. because I was used to, you know, everything. Um, divorced divorced parents that remarried had other kids but still were sort of family and um so it was just chaotic because there's just so many people so that was it was all normal to me um anyway fast forward i grew up in miami i started dancing when i was in middle school slash high school and i was always like a very creative hyperactive um kid and I loved you know kind of fell in love with performing and once you know also being part of like huge family with a million people I kind of found my own thing and like my own way to sort of shine so I really took to dance and um you know I started training in high school but then uh took it really seriously when I um, moved back to New York for college so I went to school here um I moved here when I was 17 I was like Peace out. I'm done with Where'd Miami. I'm out. Her? And uh, I went to Fordham University Bronx. in the city in Lincoln Center. Look you there. No, they have, um, yeah, the, the main campus yeah. is in the Bronx, where, like, uh, some of my family lives actually right by there. But um, I actually went to the campus in Lincoln Center oh. uh, because they have a BFA program. That's, like, huh? perfect for what you were going to get. Yeah, they have a BFA program with Alvin Ailey. The I don't know if you're oh, familiar with Alvin Ailey, yeah, the yeah, dance Alvin school Alvin. company. Yeah. So, I don't know. <laughs> so uh, you know, you be knowing then. Into my art. Um, <laughs> exactly. So yeah, so I trained there. I went to school there, and. Um, and I've been performing, uh, you know, I've been pro a professional dancer ever since I graduated. Um, I've pretty much had a really consistent career. Um, I also um, uh, started working in fitness about 12 years ago. So not long after I started um, working professionally as a dancer, I started learning and training and working as a um, group fitness instructor, as a personal trainer, as a private instructor, and sort of have like added, you know, certifications and deepen that side of um, my love for movement. So um, I'm currently dancing on Broadway in The Lion King. And uh, that was one of my, actually my first jobs and that I did like over 10 years ago. And then I am back at it now. So it's, I'm in this kind of crazy uh, place in my life, kind of full circle where like um, I, I, I explored a million things. I moved to Vegas for a year. I did two shows out there. I met my husband. Um, I started my own company. I have kids and now I'm back in New York and I'm, um, dancing on Broadway again, which I never expected or thought could happen. So, um, very cool. That's me. I, I got a, <laughs> I got a, 
I got to geek out for one second uh, because I too love Alvin Ailey. Um, I performed uh, oh. Alvin Ailey numbers in my dance uh, school in um, high school. I was very heavily involved in performing arts. Are you trained? You were a dancer in high school. I was a dancer in I high school. Pop. Um, I've, I've always been. Uh, I've always been uh, doing music since I was like in middle school. But um, singing was always my biggest thing. But. Um, our our high school where CMR and I grew up had a nationally renowned show choir, so like we would perform all over the oh. country and stuff. Ohio's show choirs uh, are like dude. so competitive. Uh, it's it, the whole Midwest, really. Indiana, <laughs> Illinois, it's like it's like a whole yeah. Midwest. But Ohio is like not playing games. Yeah, it's what they base Glee <laughs> off of, pretty much. So uh, exactly, it's really that crazy. So, but but Alvin Ailey, the numbers we performed in um, my dance uh, high uh, school in high school. But also uh, the music it's based off of Moses Hogan, the music of Moses Hogan, um, who got a shout out our choir director for like exposing us to that when we were kids because it's like that music very like it was in- inspired awesome. me uh, as a musician, but it also is some of the most beautiful music I've ever known. So, yo, I just want to say it. though, like yeah, gang, gang, really get busy. Rizzo gets busy, but. I took one of those right. obey classes one time with Michelle. <laughs> so for the listeners and the watchers, Michelle, she she kind of just skimmed over it. She's a fitness instructor. She's super fit. You'll never guess how old she is. And I'm not. <laughs> I'm 92. <laughs> I'm honest <laughs> about that it. Ain't my, that ain't my business to expose. All I know is the lady gives classes. I said, I'm going to do one. It wasn't me. It was my girlfriend at the time, who you know. Uh, and she like, man, we're going to do it with Obey. You get the app. Boom, boom, boom. Bro, you tripping. You tripping. <laughs> Why are you going this hard? Like, <laughs> what, what, like, what's your motivation? What are you going? What are you going after? Because you're super fit. Your tone is ill. Like, I mean, like, you you literally look like you mailed in with the bricks behind you. You are a brick. <laughs> okay. So. But did you have fun? No. no you were suffering, probably. No. Yeah. Listen, I'm good. Listen, you I'm had fun. Out. I've been working out since I was 19 years old. I'm not going to tell my age, but I'm older. And I've been doing it for a minute. And she was like, oh, oh. You can't we, get ready we, for this. Hung out with y'all. That one time, uh, at the house, uh, G, cook, your husband, he cooked. At the house. At the house, and he cooked, and he cooked, and it was a vibe, and we got too saucy. We drank too many bottles of wine, and you convinced us that we needed to get on the Obey platform, and I was like, okay, we're going to get on the, she, and she remembered, and she was like, we got to get on the Obey platform, and so we got what on it? it. So Obey um, is a company that I, well, I'm no longer working oh, so for actually, but that I them. we gotta uh, delete all of this. <laughs> delete, delete. No, it's all good. It's always, it's always love. I only do things, you know, that from my heart. So I don't work there anymore, but that, it's all love. Well, did that um, so I was one of the. Michelle, you supposed to answer, please, because we're trying to figure out what's new with you. I was one of the founding instructors um, for this app. It's, you know, a streaming platform for, it's a fitness and lifestyle thing, kind of like Peloton, you know, so we have like every single kind of workout you can imagine. And so I have like live, I would teach live classes and also on demand content. And what I teach is like sort of like dance based um, fitness, like bar and sculpt and dance cardio and like stretching. Bro, bro. And it's, of course, if you've ever taken, like, as you know, you have dance experience. If you've ever taken, like, a bar class or a sculpt class, like, it's a million tiny little movements that you have to, like, you know, it's all about your mobility and, like, endurance and stuff. So it's very challenging. Like, you could be, like, a gym head. And like, you're you going to die. Pick up you're heavy ass shit. I mean, the, and you're going to die in that class. The two, hardest, so, the two hardest workouts I've ever done are <laughs> jujitsu and a yoga sculpt okay. class. Because it's like CrossFit exactly, so. yoga in a hot room, and it doesn't stop. Okay, and it so, you're dead. So, yeah, so, so imagine, you know, sort of that vibe, but um, Pilates, you, you know, know yoga, all that kind of stuff. So, and, knees, and she wants you to lift one leg up to work this glute, and you're like, 
don't stop. It doesn't stop. I did that shit for one time, and I was like, yeah, I'm not rocking with Michelle, bro. I'm going to rock with a different level. I'm not rocking with Michelle. You're not ready. We have beginner levels, too. I mean, I, I completed it. I completed it. You know, oh, I'm, oh, big, oh. I'm big dog. <laughs> but at the end of the day, I was you cried I a like, little Michelle, bit. Michelle, really, he's literally responsible <laughs> for people's deaths. <laughs> she can't work COVID. It's not the first time I've heard it. So, Michelle, being um, being in the fitness world, are you yeah. uh, are you a big sports fan or no? Not really. Um, you know what? I uh, yes and no. I'm a fair weather sports fan. Okay. I'm going to be honest. Um, I grew up, my dad is a sports fanatic. My stepfather, who um, I grew up with, is a sports fanatic, especially <laughs> basketball. Uh -huh. So um, I do like sports. I do love basketball, especially. Like, I can watch, I can watch basketball. Um, but again, you know, I, I'm not going to come home and turn on the game or something yeah, like that. In a, in a previous relationship with, you know, a partner that was also a sports fanatic, uh -huh. Yes, because our lifestyle um, catered to that, yeah. right? So we would go to games. We would watch the game at home. We would have, you know, social events. My husband now is also an artist and is European and doesn't give a shit. Like, he did figure skating when he was a kid. Yeah. So that's, like, the extent yeah, well, of, like, his, like, shout out to athleticism. Georgia, Even though he's, like, very active, very loves, fit. Um, he's... He, <laughs> yeah, he's not like he's not gonna talk shop when it comes to sports. So in my lifestyle he now, actually. he told he us what? that on the episode. Yeah. Oh, exactly. So there you go. So, uh, so yeah. So my life right now, unless I go home for the holidays or for like a vacation, then I'm hanging with my dad and we'll watch a game. You know, you know, things like that. Like, or I'll keep up with stats. But um, but I do love like I loved uh, being active, playing outside, playing basketball with the boys outside, running around, riding bikes, like playing football in the, in the neighborhood. Um, I never played a sport growing up because I was dancing and into the arts, but, um, but like outside playing in the hood. Yeah. All, like loved it. Yeah. Loved sports. In the hood in Miami? Where are you from in Miami? I grew up in the beach. South I grew beach. up in Miami beach. Um, well, I guess now, you know, they'd be changing the names of things. Now it's, I guess, what is known as North Beach. Okay. So it's not higher. South Beach, like, you know, Ocean Drive. It's yeah. higher. Um, and, you know, uh, neighborhoods evolved. So it was a little bit different. It was definitely a different community. It was a lot of Cubans. Mm -hmm. um, and it was very diverse. It was a very diverse neighborhood. A lot of Cubans, a lot of Haitians, a lot of Jews, a lot of, um, you know, there were some other Caribbean, like Dominican, Puerto Rican, and some um, West Indian. It was a very mixed neighborhood, mm -hmm. uh, but a lot of Cubans and Brazilians, so I you're would like say. the first person uh, that I've ever met outside of, well, you're from Miami, but like, I would say the word Juban, and nobody knew what I meant. And, and nobody I knows remember, like, <laughs> what a thing that is. Because I like dated a girl one time. <laughs> And I was like, oh, she's a Jew. And you yeah. looked at me, and you're like, Juban? What do you know about Juban? Who yeah. says, you, how and do you know like, that word? I get her on my phone. I mean, yeah. yeah. Um, because there's a huge population uh, community, in, obviously, in Miami of, like, Cuban Jews. And, and other places, too. Like, I met um, Jubans in Mexico City. And I was like, oh, y'all out here, too. Hey, like, okay, Rizzo, cool. Like, tell us your Mexico I, City experience. Oh my yeah! Oh my God, no! Oh, <laughs> but uh, before we do that, my wife is Cuban and Irish, so I guess. But more Irish. Chicago wow. than either. Yeah, more Chicago than anything. But she, we actually literally just saw her ninety-one-year-old Cuban grandma, who is like they don't the matriarch die, right? of the family. She's. The best, like the the best character of life. I love this woman so much. Um, yeah. but Literally, married no, Mexico City. What my? Are you talking about my bachelor party? Yes, bachelor party. Don't get into the yeah. bachelor party because we're not trying to expose no. all of this stuff. <laughs> we're not. No. So basically, long story short. Yeah. So I I flying home from Cancun is like a connecting flight in uh, Mexico City. Had to fly back to L.A. And my buddy was with me. We were coming back from our bachelor party. 
And the bachelor party kind of had its ups and downs of a weekend. And so we're coming back pretty tired and worn out. And we get to Mexico City. And uh, basically, the flight kept getting delayed to go to L.A. because there was fog and you they couldn't like land planes. Um, but they just kept delaying it and delaying it and delaying. Then all of a sudden, we're sitting there in the airport and they like do an announcement in Spanish over the speaker. And like everybody who spoke Spanish ran to the exit. And everybody who didn't speak Spanish is just like left there like, what's yeah. going on? Yeah. And so well, yeah. I just snapped. I was like, hey, somebody's got to like, help us out here. <laughs> and so there was this group of uh, people waiting in line. They're like, hey, come over here. Like, hang out with us. And we made friends with these people while we were waiting in line. And we ended up getting sh- just like stranded for the night and stayed in a, like an airport hotel near the, the, near the airport. But it was a nice hotel. But like if you go right outside the airport of Mexico City, it's kind of – it's a little – it's a little sketch. So, yeah. but then, well, right? I feel like right outside the airport in any city yeah, for sure. is always. So, it's so we stay the night sure. in Mexico Point City. Then I get home. <laughs> I get home and I got sick from the water. So it was just kind of like a you know, oh, one thing after the next type no. of situation. So, but that was my Mexico City. So, story. I've never been to Mexico City outside of that. I've always wanted to go back and experience like, like all you, Oh, all you over. Mexico City is like hands down one of my favorite places on earth and like you definitely have to go back and he redeem yourself. He was like yourself. super scared. Sure. He's a white boy and he thought that I was going to sell it to the Mexicans <laughs> and I was like, dude, they don't want you, bro. You weren't even with us. I, I know. scared. We, we were just there. annoyed. Back <laughs> I I had a direct flight to Newark. <laughs> I had a direct flight to Newark. So I was good, but he called me yeah. Because he, he was supposed to get home bed sooner time, than us, and it didn't happen. And I was like, bro, I mean, white guys just sell for more, bro. Women even more, bro. You know, we're just going to put you into the human trafficking. See what Epstein is no. going to pay for it. What? No. Wow, Damari. Wow. Deep, dark. Oh, kind of real deep dark and dark. <laughs> deep and dark, Michelle. Um, <laughs> so here's the deal, right? So mm-hmm. we got to take a break right now. And we have to go into Yay. allegedly. Yes. So allegedly, okay. uh, allegedly, Donald Trump has taken documents from the White House mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and people are upset about those documents that he's taken. Mm-hmm. Allegedly. Allegedly. There's a whole lot of sealing and unsealing that's going on. And I just want to know, Ciamara, what's your take mm-hmm. on Donald Trump taking documents, sealing them, unsealing them? What's your take? Mm-hmm. So let me preface by I personally and like. I do not preferably watch the news because it's just too much for me. My mom, she will watch the news in the living room for 15 hours a day. And I just, I can't, you know, I prefer not to. So I've heard about this. I'm not surprised about it. Donnie is going to do what Donnie wants to do. And (laughs) I think that I'm not surprised about it. Now, if this is something that an American president has actually done, we need to figure out I don't I I'll be honest with you, I don't even entertain. I don't entertain the news. I don't care enough. And I care about our US government and I just hope that we figure it out. But I think that there's way too many distractions going on right now for anyone to actually know what the fuck is going on. Excuse my language, but mm. I know enough to know that I know nothing at all. So if I'm sitting back and I hear that Donald Trump so- stole something from the U.S. government, whatever I think is probably not going to matter. But I will say on this podcast that if it does have to do with something really important that he stole and took back to his house in Mar-a-Lago, we need to figure out what Donnie was stealing because Donnie Mm. has his hands on something that all of us need to know. Okay. That's what I'll Mm. say on that. I like that. I love that take actually. I really do. For God. What she said, (laughs) like a hundred percent what she said, I get my news from Facebook and Instagram because it's the most Mm -hmm. trusted place. (laughs) Right. (laughs) 
Um, is that <laughs> and if there's anything right. that Rizzo never does that, excuse and, me, because I was not expecting him to laugh at Facebook, but I understand why he did, but I've never seen it before. Rizzo, take it back. And, Don't take you? It back and not, so. Don't you? Um, and also, <laughs> If there's something that I I need to further that I hear about and I need to further investigate, then like I'm good with NPR or like CNN. Now or we got to dig like that. deeper. We got to um, dig deeper because he just laughed at the Facebook thing, and I, well, and she was being lied. sarcastic, and right? Rizzo, you got a question? Y- yes and no. I was being sarcastic because because obviously it's not the most trusted place. Yeah, that's what I thought she was. It's saying. literally, it's literally like when I pick up my phone and. It's. I guess it's not Facebook. It's like yeah. you know, what, Apple News or whatever. What, whatever comes up, I'm like, oh, mm-hmm. what this happened? So then I will do if it entices me. If 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 I have time to mm-hmm. to divulge to to give brain cells to it, I will mm-hmm. research it and then I'll. I have also. I have like I would say like um, a, like my board. Like I have my people. There are certain people that I tap into You've for never certain things. Me. So, like, if it has to do with policy, you're my financial advisor. Don't what are you talking about? about? What we do here on this platform. <laughs> the thing is this. <laughs> well, I edit it. I think I should be uh, uh, appointed to the committee. <laughs> Listen, you're good. You have to audition. Mario um, always wants to be on the committee. So, on people's <laughs> so yeah, so I have you know friends who run political campaigns. I have friends who are in edu- educators. I have friends who are you know art historians. So if there is information that I need to be educated about in like layman terms, I just be like, yo, Tiffany, what's up with this? Or yo, Susie, so, what's Michelle, up with that? You feel that there's um, like. Uh, a bias when they give you that information or you just really trust what they say? There's a bias that I respect and I know their biases. So, you know, it's like, I know that, you know, my friend Sian is like, just call her Bernie Sanders. She's like extreme liberal, you know, like all these things. And I know that that's her perspective, but I respect that. And it doesn't mean that I have, that it needs to be, um, a subjective, uh, you know, piece of information, you know, like I will take it objectively regardless of how she feels about it. But I know that I can trust that she's informed. Right. Mm-hmm. So you take, so, a- you know, yeah. if I'm like, so anyway, going back you to Donald Trump, Trump having to say that on your team, Trump do I have what on your team? My family's from Miami. Like well, what you think I'm dealing with? <laughs> Some Cubans or you're Dominican, but the big thing has been Cuban in, in Miami, where some of them are, most of them are actually Trump supporters, and then other ones were not. Yeah. So, uh, how are you? Yeah, you know, most Latinos in South Florida, you know, err on the side of Republican or conservative or Trump supporting for, for you know, those reasons. So I definitely am well balanced, for sure. Yeah. Um, I'm not a supporter of Donald Trump. Mm-hmm. I Things you know, I I I I think it's like he's he's a great um, combination of like reality TV right. and business mm. and the shit show that is our government. Mm. So like he mm. is like a great blend of all those things, and like so I think that there are things about him that I'm like that's badass. Mm. He's ballsy and he's gonna get it done, whether I agree with what he's doing or not. And then there are things about him, just his character and and his vision of, you know, what he wants America to be that I don't agree with. And so I don't tend to give energy to anything that has to do with him. Oh, so hold on um, for a second, please. I wanna shift to uh CMR in a second, but before we started this recording, you mentioned that you don't believe in balance, and then you just said something that kind of directly goes against what you just said, and I don't want to get into what, what was said before the conversation, so I just want you to dig a little bit deeper, if you can, on this whole, you can agree with certain things and you don't agree with certain things, so please enlighten us. Well, I mean, I think we're all complex, dynamic people and 
we're not just one thing, right? And so you can have great qualities, you can have flaws, you can have good intentions and um, bad motives or vice versa. And so using him as an example, like I said, like as a whole person, I can, I can appreciate or I can acknowledge that there are things about him that are good for lack of a better word or that I value. And there are other things about him that I don't, um, you know, pros and cons classics. So, uh, in, in general, as a whole, I don't fuck with him. Um, but that doesn't mean that I can't appreciate, you know, that he's going to get shit done and that he, um, you know, has leadership qualities that if he had good motives or good intentions or things that I agreed with, you know, I could be like behind him 100%. Okay. And I think that's sort of with everybody. How, sorry if you, didn't, if you didn't say it, but how many kids do you have? I have two kids. I have a two-year-old little boy and I have a three-and-a-half-year-old little girl. And so oh. is, it, is, it, is the dynamic um, when – with – having a boy and a girl is there what's the dynamic like is it is something where you kind of notice things where one kind of because i know my my brother and his wife they have a boy and a girl and it's interesting because i've noticed that like the the boy he's younger and he has like the same mannerisms that she had when she was that age and it's so weird to see it because they're completely different humans but like that I don't know if they get it from each other or if they're just kind of, it's like an innate thing. I mean, I think there's some things are nurture and some things are nature. Like when I look at my son and I'm like, he looks exactly like my dad and my brother and he has mannerisms of my dad and my brother and he's not growing up in the same household as them. So how is that possible? So that's just like nature. That's just lineage genetics, you know? Um, my kids are very stereotypically like the girl, she's the older one and she's like extremely intelligent and sassy. She's like a three major and you're just like, whoa, like you're a whole human <laughs> already. Like you can see how like the female species is just way more advanced than the male species. Like it's just nature. Up until and a of course, point. We, come on now. Like, Ish, like yeah, when you guys like after twenty seven, then maybe you guys start to sort of get it together. Maybe that's good to know. Maybe no, it's it's like factual. I'm not kidding. <laughs> and my little boy is a trouble dite. He's just like an animal. He's the sweetest, cutest beast. I'm just like kid. Get it together. He's just I'm, like I'm like truly sad that I haven't met him yet because it's like oh you you I, he's just I, he's he's amazing. They're amazing. They're both amazing. I picked them on phone <laughs> of me, Hoda, and Luna, and then Elio came and I'm like, wait, you got I know like, well, he came. He was a pandemic baby. So known. first of all, I thought that was dope, <laughs> that you have a I'm a very hippie of me. <laughs> I was like so into it. I was like, "Oh, they're dope." I always oh knew that you guys were no secretly point. my tribe, but no, I want to take it a little bit deeper yeah. before we get into Ciamara, which is what was that transition like from being a person who's never birthed another human to I have literally pushed someone through my vaginal canal? Yeah, <laughs> we want to know. We want the people want to. Um. Okay, so physically, obviously, it's the most insane, amazing miracle. Like, women are superheroes, Mm -hmm. and the experience of growing a human inside of you and then laboring and delivering a human, there's nothing. And this is why I, because I was like, why didn't anybody really tell me the truth? Like, why don't we talk about it? Like, But I think we don't because I think the brain actually deletes and suppresses certain things so that we can continue to have children Mm -hmm. and, you know, push the human race forward because I think we would stop. It's like very painful to the point where you wouldn't do it again, but you did it again. So what's up? 
Yes, because I just think that you're capable, the humans are capable of doing really hard things and you can't anticipate it because then there's more fear mm. of actually doing it. You just have to go through it. And it's also a very natural thing. And that's a whole separate conversation. Like the physical part of it is extremely challenging, but I think culturally and society and the way that we like, you know, all of that, that, you know, the way that we labor and deliver kids and hospital settings and all that, like it's, is a different conversation because it's, it's, we can really talk for hours about so that. You had, but you I you think had a traditional birth in a hospital. Yeah, I did. I did. Both of my kids were born in a hospital. I had medicated births, which I didn't, that wasn't like necessarily part of my birth plan, but that's how it went. And I was lucky to have like, you know, good experiences and everything was okay and everyone was okay. And like I said, like the physical part of it is extremely challenging and like just abnormal, but, um, we're completely capable of it. And then you rec you can, you know, mostly recover from that. I think the biggest, bigger adjustment is just like, um, the mental, you know, like you have a human now, like they're here to stay and this is another person added to your family and like everything shifts and everything changes. And like, you are no longer, it's no longer about you. Now it's all about these other people that are your roommates that are living here like free. <laughs> you gotta feed. They're not contributing. They're not contributing. And you got to like feed them and take care of them and buy diapers. And, and you're like, Oh, and you know, yeah, you like love them cause you made them, but like it took a minute. It also took a minute. You're just like, it's so overwhelming. It's so much responsibility. It's, it's so amazing too, you know, but like being realistic, like being honest about it, it's, it's something that, um, you know, it, it's hard to explain because it's so many things. Um, but of course it's beautiful. Like if that's, you know, if, if, if you want a family and, and that's, and that's for you, then, just like in any relationship or anything that's worth it, like the good and the bad, you know, will, will be there. Yeah. There's there going to be some really well, hard, really challenging well, times. We didn't but, really get to get into it, but you totally hated on balance for a second, but we're not going to do that right now. Yeah, there's no right. hating on it. It's just having, it's just having realistic expectations mm -hmm. of what, of that existing. Mm -hmm. oh. It's like, mm -hmm. what does balance mean for you? Maybe balance means for you the realistic part where it's like, okay, it's going to be a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And it's going to be all over the place. And then maybe you're realistic. But I think the picture that in society that we, that is painted that before we experience is that we buy, it's like, oh yeah, like I'm going to be, you know, able to do it all or you can do it all. But for some You're a people, super mom. You can do it all. For some people, that's a, that's a reality, right? So I just want to shift but also, to Amara. So see Amara, like, do you want children? If so, like what's holding you back? I, I know you don't have them, yeah. right? but what, what's your deal? Yeah, I mean, to kind of touch on the balance portion of it, similar to what Brandon was mentioning earlier, is like, I think balance for me is not always 50 50, but it's sometimes that 70 30, right? Like, it's that 20 80 of knowing I can't show up all the time, but if I can't, I know that you got me and like you're going to keep pulling for me. I if you it. don't have that, then I got you, right? So that's what mm -hmm. balances for me. It's not necessarily the 50 50, but it's like, we can still balance at the end of the day, but also too, that's coming from a place of me knowing that I don't have kids and I've never been married. Right. So I, uh, for me, I can't mentally, mentally grasp the idea of growing a child inside of me and I want two children. So it's going to, it's going to happen <laughs> God willing eventually. Right. So it's something that I'm looking forward to. But like when I look at my mom, sometimes it's like, I was really in your stomach. And like, I just don't understand that. Mm. But at the same time, it's the most beautiful thing. How many siblings do you have? I have one other sibling. He's two and a half years older than me. His name is Miguel. And it's so funny because she was mentioning like the balance of like having the sassy daughter. Like my brother is almost three years older than me. And I will still tell him what to do till this day. Like I am the sassy daughter. <laughs> it's, I'm just it's, like, it's, so, <laughs> it's so funny how it's really like that. <laughs> yeah. I will definitely tell him what to do and I have no problem with it either. Um, 
but yeah, I definitely do want to have children. It's so funny because I thought maybe around this time I would be having kids, but that requires having a husband, maybe. Hey, a, you, a just, suitor, you just hold on. Who knows? Yeah, you know, so we'll see. We'll see. But um, yeah. that's how I feel about kids. I'm excited about it. Michelle, what do you have to say? I mean, she's literally had two big ass heads go through because I've met those kids. Well, I haven't met, <laughs> I haven't met Moon. I haven't met no. I haven't met Sun. I've only met Moon. Pictures of my in my Her name is Luna Moon. But I've never had a human head pass through my urethra. Well. It doesn't necessarily have to be that way. You could have a C-section. Mm -hmm. That's true, but is that I didn't. Meaning? But no, I want water. No, I don't care. Like when I have my wife, I'm telling her like water, water, water. Yeah, I just don't trust hospitals. Well, when you have your wife, right? When you have your wife, whatever your wife, you won't be speaking do. a whole different language. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. She's not going to hear what I'm saying, but He's I'm, a, I'm a I'm a deep lover. <laughs> And I truly believe that we're going to get what we want. We're setting out, for me, I only want someone is about that water birth life. So, like... You only <laughs> want someone... <laughs> Wait, let's bring it back. You only want someone that's about the water birth life. Miguel, I can see you. I support that. I support that. I super support that. Yeah, I'm only about that water birth life. I want to be in the fucking uh, pool with them. I want to pull it out. I want to coach her. And we got a whole baby right here. Well, we're going to, let's talk about a whole different podcast for that. <laughs> yeah, for That's sure. That's going to be a, a different podcast. Well, no, we got just, time. Well, actually, y'all don't have time. because We, we don't have time. Unfortunately, we no, do we need to wrap it up. Because so, y'all give given This is like so one of my favorite time. episodes because we tapped into some things that we don't really get to talk about with people. And you oh, both yeah. were very vulnerable. Water birth. Yeah. <laughs> I love water birth. Like, I don't. I'm not. I'm never marrying anybody that's not about that water birth life. You're not on my frequency. You're not <laughs> so beyond that, um, you both were just like super vulnerable, super open. Uh, but uh, our time has come to an end. So Michelle, if the people are looking for you, because we didn't even get to get into how you work people glutes out all day. Uh, my butt's bigger because I switched to uh, Michelle. My ass is popping, people. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I know, I'm, I'm the silliest. Where can we find you if people are looking for you, Michelle? Well, you can find me on social media. You can find me on Instagram, Brugal Body Moves. Um, yeah. Brugal Body Moves. We'll plug that in the show notes. See you, Mara. Where can yes. people find you if they're looking for you? Okay, where can we buy your book? Yes, so everyone can find me at Ciomara Ariel. That's all my socials, whether it's YouTube, Twitter, or Instagram, starting with an X. And then I'm also available on Amazon and Kindle. You guys can find my book, A God's Dream. Yeah. And okay. yeah, I'm always happy to connect, so just DM me. I love that title. How much is the book? Selling for the book's twelve twenty two. Oh come on! And then I, five five five. I, I'm gonna version. buy it tonight, people. Come on, <laughs> buy so, it tonight. I uh, yeah. Send me your screenshot. I, come on, what I got twelve. <laughs> so, Rizzo, if the people are looking for you, where can they find you, my brother? You can find me at Rizzo Fields. And where and can you, they find you? And you can find me at JudahClan dot com or JudahClan on all social media. Until next time. Until next time, my friend. We're by my side. Appreciate you. Peace. small business owner, young professional, or pre-retiree looking to grow and protect your assets but don't know where to start? With all the noise about stocks, bonds, cryptos, it can be hard to know what steps to take. Let Black Swan Financial Group help you so you can focus on doing what you're good at. Black Swan Financial Group is a telefinancial planning firm operating in select states nationwide. They're here to help you protect, create, and grow your assets. Visit 
blackswanfinancialgroup.com today to get your free consultation. Hey everybody, Brandon and Damari from Side by Side here. Just want to tell you about one of our newest sponsors, Ease Web Development. Ease Web Development specializes in building high conversion websites and marketing campaigns that take your business to the next level. They're the easy decision when it comes to marketing. So check them out now at www.easewebdev.com. That's ease, W-E-B-D-E-V.com.